Hi, Shannon. Welcome Hello. back to the sisterhood. It's so good to be back. Thank you. Oh, we are. <laughs> it, this feels just so right to have it you does. back here and talking about friendship and this phase of life and how we make it happen. Uh, Shannon, why don't you catch us up? It's probably been three or four years since it's, you've been. Yeah. I on. mean, my last book was four years ago, so I bet it was four years. Okay. Yeah. What's been going on in your life since then? What's, what's well, the newest? The, the newest is everybody here is four years older. So, uh -huh. <laughs> so that includes, you know, me yep. and everything that comes with that. And then it also means that all of my kids are teenagers now, or mm -hmm. we still have, of course, Robert, our big kid who's out of the house, he's in his twenties, but here in the Martin house, it's, it's all teenagers all the time. And that's just a shift, you know, it's mm -hmm. like you, you blink and it happens just like everybody says. Um, but you know, everything that goes along with that. So, so a little more chaos, just getting people where they're going and, you know, only one of them is driving still. So, but we have a driver, you know, like, it's <laughs> like, I'm eager to, to add another one to those ranks, but just having, having Cal driving is helpful. Um, yeah, sports and all the things. And then Corey is still working at the, he's still working as the chaplain mm -hmm. at our county jail here. So his work is, continues to expand and um, it's going really well. And then since I was here last time, I'm also working a part-time job outside the home. I'm, a, I'm on staff at our community nonprofit that feeds our neighbors. So basically the shorthand is it's a soup kitchen, but we don't really call it a soup kitchen because we make a lot more than soup. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we cook a, a hot lunch, mostly from scratch Monday through Friday, um, and serve it to about 120 people. We serve meals on wheels as well. And yeah, I get to do that. I get to chop and stir and serve food two or three days a week. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. it sounds delicious Yeah, and, uh, it sounds purposeful. It's perfect for me. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, I've always been a foodie and a, a person who loves to eat and loves to think about food and loves to make food for other people. So it's been a really, it's been a really fun surprise for me. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Shannon. I love so much that you're doing that. And I can just imagine the, just the ministry of presence, honestly, that you bring to the people you're working yeah. with and the people you're serving. Like yeah. that's so beautiful. And, and honestly, the, the ways that goes both ways, mm, you know, yeah. like just, so just within just in August, we opened up the kitchen. So, you know, we've been dealing with pandemic restrictions and all those things too. Mm. And when you think about having a dining room filled with, you know, anywhere between 40 and 80 people at one time eating, it made for a really challenging atmosphere. And so we were serving meals to go for, I mean, years yeah. and we just, we just reopened in August. And that has been such a, I think we were all kind of nervous because we were so rusty and out of practice, but seeing so many of the same folks come back and, you know, remembering each other and interacting again and meeting new babies and, and, really grieving the ones who we lost mm -hmm. in that amount of time. But it's just such a, mm -hmm. it's like, it, it was meaningful all along, but being able to say hi to our friends again, face to face just makes it so much better. Yeah, I know nothing replaces it. It just doesn't. No. Well, so your life is more full than it's ever been. It sounds like yeah. with older kids and working part-time there. And then you're really, you're really writing full-time as well. Yeah. So Tell us a little bit about friendship in this season and where are you even where you're at today with friendship? Yeah. I mean, I think this is, it's, it's such a, an important conversation because it can feel so tricky and it can feel, it can feel challenging in some ways when you get to this phase of life, because you're, I, you know, I, I'll just speak for myself when my kids were younger, which I want to clarify I don't know that my life is fuller now. I found the, the little baby and toddler and preschool age to be really, really hard. So it's just a different kind of busy though. It's a different, mm -hmm. it's a different sort of chaos, I guess. Um, but I know those younger phases are really, can be really challenging, but once you get past some of those little kid ages, I'm just not even with my kids as much. 
So those natural connecting points, you know, when I was a PTO mom at the elementary school, or, mm -hmm. you know, you think of all the things your, your younger kids do, and it can feel a little more natural to connect with other moms, you know, who, you know, your, your daughter's best friend's mom, you end up kind mm -hmm. of hanging out sometimes and friendship can kind of grow from that. But once they're off doing their own thing and they don't need me, my kids don't need me as much as they used to. And, and then you've got to kind of figure things out for yourself. And, and I think it can be too easy to put it on the back burner and kind of tell ourselves, you know, this feels vulnerable. This feels um, risky in some way, like the risk of rejection or just feeling awkward or all the things that go into kind of forming and maintaining friendships, we can tell ourselves, and I've been there before, like I've told myself, like, I'm good. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't need, you know, I'm, I'm fine. I'm busy enough. I've got too much on my plate anyway, you know, make all the excuses to kind of find that trap door away from putting ourselves out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I'm sure so many people can relate to that phase where you realize, wait a minute, I used to hang out on the sports sidelines with people. Yeah, right. I mean, even when your kids transition from high school into college, yes, you used to go to high school games and now you go, you think, do I still go? Is right. that, is that weird? I, I don't have anyone on the field anymore. Um, and, and it is this unique time of really figuring out, wait, what do I want? Yeah. And what do I need? Because before it just kind of landed in my lap. Maybe. Right. Yeah. You and just... now I, yeah. I need to work for it. Yeah. So how does someone start thinking about what do I want or what do I yeah. need? I, I am a big fan of thinking about this conversation more from the angle of natural proximity than even, you know, this idea of, of kind of, you know, go find your people. We can turn that in some ways into go find people who are like you and be friends with them. And, and for me, I have found in a lot of ways that the very opposite, just kind of looking around and saying, you know, who else is nearby? Who else might be a little lonely? Um, I think we're all honestly a little lonely, whether we acknowledge that or not. But some of my closest and dearest friendships happened when I was feeling desperate enough, you know, when we moved to this community 10 years ago, and I didn't know anybody and I was floundering a little bit and I had these little kids and life felt chaotic and really boring and cooped up and all those things all at the same time. But there was one woman in particular who I had met her at our church. Um, but, but I was in my thirties at that time. She was in her sixties. You know, I was married with little kids. She was not married and, and has never had kids like on paper, we had nothing in common. So you know, for people involved in, in churches, a lot of times churches kind of group people according to like life phase and, you know, all these similarities, our church is just really small and tiny and we didn't do that. So Becca kind of caught my eye. I thought she was funny. And I just had a feeling that maybe she was, maybe she was looking for a friend too. And we, I, you know, I put myself out there a little bit and said, would you want to meet for coffee sometime? And we, she became one of my very, very best friends. And so for me, the lesson was rather than, than always trying to feel like I need to find somebody who's already so similar to me, maybe there's something really special and just saying, you know, here you are, here I am. What if we just kind of did this thing and we just kind of got to know each other in a really intentional way? It's interesting. When I listen to that, I often think, well, maybe the younger person would say, I want that person to mentor me or, you know, if, if there's yeah. a big age gap, like more yeah. of like a mentoring, but what I appreciate about what you said is no, it was just a reach across the table of yes. friendship. Yeah. Not Be mentoring. <laughs> Becca, very sadly, we lost Becca a couple of years ago and it was broke my heart. Um, but if she were here and even heard the idea of her mentoring me, she would laugh so hard. <laughs> Um, because I think you're right. You know, there was just, we really saw each other over time as we got to know each other, we really saw each other just as not peers, but like, you know, we didn't, we didn't really think about the differences between us. We just started to settle in on the common ground that we did have. And 
it was just, it was just more interesting. It was really fun and interesting to, to seek intentional friendship with somebody who saw the world from a different place. Her experiences were very different than mine. Our politics were very different. And yet we would, you know, we would get together and talk all this stuff out and disagree sometimes, but we would laugh a lot. And at the end of the day, you know, just that's what happens when we put that time in. And when we say, Mm -hmm. okay, we're just committed to this and we're not going to freak out if we don't see everything in the same way. It's a real opportunity for growth. I mean, she changed my life and I, I know she would say, and she did say to me before that she felt the same way. Like our friendship just in so many ways brought out the best in us. And, and it made me ever more committed to getting past this idea that we need to only seek friendship with people who are, you know, air quotes like us. So I'm focusing on that line. You just said that if we have differences, we don't freak out. (laughs) I think when we're looking at this idea of friendship, Mm -hmm. that feels really central to me because I really don't understand why in our brains, we think that somehow unity means uniformity of thinking like that is, that is not a correct thought. And honestly, we'll never find someone who thinks exactly like us. We just won't. Yeah. So can you talk a little more about how you approach that with people and how you don't let your view define you so that, you know, cause then it becomes becomes a giant chasm that you can't cross. Right. Right. So how do you just let the person be the person and you be you right. and let the ideas be the ideas? How do you yeah. do that? Well, I have to say, I think in a strange way, my personality is wired a little bit to embrace kind of the idea of conflict or tension, maybe more than other personalities. And I just say that to simply say, it doesn't mean that I'm better at this. It just means that I'm a bit different. And I, I want to always honor that where that might come more naturally to me, a lot of us feel really nervous about the idea of, you know, differing opinions or what we think of as conflict or disagreement. Um, I think you said it well, though, unity does not imply uniformity. So when my family moved into this neighborhood 10 years ago, you know, I didn't know anybody. And for the first time really in my life, I was living in a place where I was immediately and with a lot of proximity, just near people who didn't look or live or believe exactly as I did. And and there's part of me that knows, I don't think anyone ever said in so many words Um, that I should be afraid of difference, but I had somehow kind of absorbed that message through childhood and young adulthood. Like, you know, there were certain differences that just, it was kind of like, you know, steer clear, circle up, you know, don't, don't go there. And when I found myself in a situation where I just was, was really, I had a lot more exposure to difference. I, I discovered the, the gift of curiosity And just being willing to be curious about how others see the world, how others experience the world, um, what they believe, how they believe. And, you know, just to to continue on with the example of Becca, it was really refreshing, if I'm being honest. And and I can think of so many others where I would, I, I can think of so many conversations early on sitting at that same coffee house and, you know, having these conversations. And in my mind, I'm like, you know, my mind is, is just kind of being blown in some ways, because it's like, all of a sudden you realize we can do this. Like mm-hmm. we can just be friends with each other. We can be human together. Um, we don't have to tick off all the same boxes and I can be curious about, about her and, and her life and her perspectives. And I think over time, sometimes that does kind of, that's how we grow and that's how we change. And we don't need to be afraid of that, but it also doesn't mean that, you know, just everything about ourselves is going to change overnight. And, you know, I think those are some of the fears I grew up with is like, if you become too proximate with people who believe differently than you, it's almost like they're, it's going to kind of overtake you or something. And that's not (laughs) true either. It sounds silly to say, Mm -hmm. but you know, there's just, there's Mm -hmm. just this fear. And so I think if we, if we allow ourselves just, you know, give ourselves permission to, to truly be curious and to see each other as really interesting people, life just becomes richer and it becomes more interesting. And along the way, it helps us to kind of hone in on, on 
our own beliefs and, and our own perspectives and, you know, to check our blind spots and all those things that are so important when we think of friendship and just, you know, living as neighbors together. Mm -hmm. Cause when you lead with curiosity, you give other people permission to be who they are. Yeah. I just think of if, if we're nervous about difference, that means every person yes. that we're coming in contact with is also nervous about difference. I mean, about that's us. a big generalization, right. Right? <laughs> right? But we can just make that assumption. Like they're also yeah. nervous. Yeah. So instead of putting the focus on ourselves, but asking ourselves, how can we put this person at ease? Yeah. Then that automatically is going to allow them to speak a little more freely. And when we seem to be not freaking out, when they right. give the answers they give, yeah, that gives them the freedom to say to not be as defensive. And it's just almost yeah. like you have to do that from the onset yeah. because as soon as defensiveness comes in, it it's hard it, to go backwards. Yeah, it takes over. It can. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I think I I also think there's there's this, you know, I write about this a little bit and start with hello, but because I think building friendship is very much a part of learning to live as neighbors because it's, you know, I think it's great to have these kind of easy, loose connections with the people. You know, I, I use the word neighbor with a lot of liberties, like mm -hmm. anybody whose life kind of intersects mine. It's not necessarily just the people to the left and to the right of me, but, but knowing the names and faces of the people around us is really the pathway to a better life. I believe that with my whole heart, but there's also these different levels of connection that a really abundant life will have. And so we'll have these kind of loose connections with the people near us, but we also need like really trusted, close friends. And those mm -hmm. aren't necessarily always going to be the same people. And I think that's kind of a good thing. It's kind of a cool thing. Um, but, but for me, as, especially as I'm, you know, I'm, I'm even past my mid forties now, like I'm creeping up towards 50, um, I, for me, it has been really just kind of life-changing in some ways to begin to just embrace exactly who I am mm -hmm. and exactly how I am and, you know, how I look and how my house looks and, and to just get real with myself about this is just the way things are instead <laughs> of just trying to put on airs or kind of fluff everything up and spruce up and we can do that for a little while and it might make it feel easier in the beginning to kind of present ourselves with, with, you know, our best foot forward. But we, if we get stuck there, that does not bring us into a place of real authentic vulnerability and connection. We just mm -hmm. will stall out at the point, you know, it's like if, and for the listener, I've showed up today right after work. And so I'm looking a little bit rough around the edges, but this is how most of my neighbors know me. You know, and so it's like, I could like really make my, try to make myself look really cute if I'm meeting a friend for the first time. And that's, and I do that sometimes. I mean, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. But after 10 times of that, all of a sudden you realize like, wait, I've set the expectation at a place that I can't really maintain it. And so I'm trying to just intentionally have the practice within myself of like pretty early on, like this is who I am. Like, just take me as I am and, and you can be exactly who you are. And we're not going to be about the business of trying to impress each other. We're just going to be companions together. And it's just, a, it's just a, a simpler and more refreshing kind of, kind of way to, to go about that. I love that you're touching on this. And that was actually one of my main questions for you is I think by midlife, people are over the superficial. Mm -hmm. They're just mm -hmm. like, okay, did that <laughs> done tired. with that ready to move on because I don't have time for that anymore. Right. right and you just right. feel tired of it. You just yeah. are, you're done with it. So that was a great practical example of how you cultivate that just by even, you know, okay, this is who I am. This is how I'm going to yeah. show up. What are some other ways that you cultivate that real connection? Yeah. I mean, for me, so much of it, has been learned from the people near me, from my, I, anything I know about living as neighbors, connecting with each other, um, inviting true hospitality and mutual generosity into my life. I have learned it from my neighbors. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of, of being quick to open up my home and 
or my back patio or, you know, just to, to be my whole full self, um, to be, to be faster about that, you know, to, to keep the door kind of easier on its hinges that, that we're, that I can be quick to invite people in and not kind of, you know, glance behind me and think like the house is a mess. I'm embarrassed. You know, I'm not going to, I've done that thing before where somebody stops by and I feel unprepared. So I walk out onto the patio, you know, mm-hmm. like, and, and like have the conversation there and then go back in your house. And as soon as that person leaves, I'm always thinking, why did I not just invite them inside? Like, Mm -hmm. like a nice, kind person. And it's because (laughs) we, we we get nervous. It feels awkward. We are afraid that we're going to be judged or we're afraid that what we have is not enough or what we are is not enough. But as I have been invited into the homes and into really the hearts of, of people, some of whom struggle in, in ways that I don't struggle and their lives are hard in ways that my life isn't hard. And, you know, they, they just, they don't have a lot and, and embracing welcome from, from some of these people has, has been a real shift for me and just accepting we are all human. My house is always kind of messy because (laughs) as my husband reminds me all the time, people live here. You know, so, so it it doesn't work to try to, to try to hide all the mess because at our, at at our core and, you know, just as humans, life is messy and it brings with it a lot of, a lot of clutter and a lot of (laughs) chaos. And if we can just, if we can push ourselves, because I don't think it comes naturally to very many of us, if we can push ourselves to kind of normalize that and to go first, to be the one to lead with that kind of vulnerability I think it often does have kind of a chain reaction where the, the other person suddenly kind of exhales like, oh, okay, so they don't have it all together. So maybe I don't have to have it all together either. Okay, I have a question for both of you. Um, I'm thinking of women in our stage of life. Some of us have more time than others and relationships require time. Mm-hmm. So how do you handle if you are wanting to maintain a relationship with someone and the time availability, there's a differential between maybe you're the one that has more time and she doesn't. And so you always feel like you're being put off, or maybe you feel like you're always saying no because of your commitments to your family and your job. How do you manage Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. while continuing to let the other person know that they are important to you? Yeah. Yeah. I am going to refer back to my blessed Becca, because that was a big part of the dynamic with the two of us. Like I said, she was retired with no kids and no family around her at all. She had her, her puppy, Chloe, (laughs) who was her whole world. Um, But I, it was always, I was always aware that she, her availability was very different than mine. And it was a little bit of a struggle early on because I did, I could, I could, fall into the trap of feeling like this is too much. I don't have time. Like I can't, you know, kind of that panic knee jerk reaction. But I also knew that every single time I, I carved out space to spend time with her, I was always, always better for it. You know, so I had to grapple with, with the situation I was in. And for me, what I ended up doing, and it worked really well was that we set an every other week we set it up like every two weeks we're having coffee together and we're going to just, I mean, so when I thought of it in that way, like, you know, it required a little bit of planning ahead, but I'm going to see her alone. I saw her at other times through the week as well, but I'm going to intentionally have time with Becca and she's going to have time with me two hours a month, which sounds so little, but it was that rhythm of, you know, letting her know that I valued our friendship. And I, I valued it enough to kind of think ahead a little bit. And in the scheme of things, I always knew I had time, you know, but it's like, Mm -hmm. we have to get over our own. Like my mind can be such a jumble of details and appointments and all these things. But, but if we, if we can think ahead just a little bit and just say, you know, I've heard some people say, I keep a certain morning or a certain, you know, two hours on a certain day kind of free for any friend stuff that might come up. And that's just kind of the slot that I put it in. 
and it sounds kind of overly scheduled, but I think it's kind of cool. And sometimes that's just what it takes. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Krista? Do you have thoughts? Yeah. I mean, I, I actually do that very thing is I have a day and I try and put everything on that day though. I also, you know, I always talk about hitching. I do hitch a lot of walks to people. So, you know, then, I mean, I'm always going to make time for exercise. It's just a value for me. And so I do try and walk with someone once a week, sometimes twice a week. And that then at least kind of does those two things at one time. I love that. Mm -hmm. I wish I would be more committed to exercise. (laughs) that's, that's a good word for me because it's true. We're trying, my husband and I are trying to, to, you know, you get a little older, especially, and you start to realize like, oh, we got to do something here. (laughs) Um, And so we are trying to walk more, but it's hard to even find time for a long, like a long walk just takes time. But I love that idea of, of kind of bringing a friend along and, you know, it makes the walk more fun and it's kind Mm -hmm. of two for one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and as, I mean, this is kind of on a different level, but even as I am working on, you know, really staying connected with Eric, my husband at this stage in life. And as we're looking at, as our kids are launching and leaving and, Mm -hmm. you know, that's become a rhythm for us and we have a dog, so it's a natural rhythm, but every night we go out together and that's our, we're walking the dog, we're talking And that's also building friendship, right? That's building that, that connection continually that, that is really important for us in this season. Yeah. So that's been something else. Mm -hmm. Well, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Alex. Well, I like both of those because the standing date does imply priority. Yeah. Like she knows that you are making her a priority. So I like the standing date. Mm -hmm. And then the multitasking, of course, is, is just a good, efficient use of time. And Krista inspired me because recently she's been scheduling walking dates with people over the phone that aren't local. And I had a, a meeting with somebody that lives States away. We were trying to come up with a meeting time and she's just going through something really hard. And I said, you know, I just wish we could go on a walk together. Yeah. So I said, I'll send you a Starbucks gift card. Cause I'd buy you a coffee if we Aww. were here and let's schedule a time and let's both go get a coffee and both yeah. walk while we're on the phone, because there is something too, about moving your body while you're talking right. that I think brings out some of that emotion Yeah. and maybe just that mind body connection of bringing out some of the things that you don't get when you're sitting on a zoom call right. or sitting even at a coffee shop face to face. Yes. Yep. The other thing Corey and I have been doing when, when we think of, you know, we have in, in life, we have, like I said, different layers of friendship and connection, but one of those layers for us is having friends, not just one-on-one friends that we both have, But, you know, having those, those other friends that we see as couples, and I've gotten away from even calling them couple friends because we have, have learned to really embrace having mutual friends who are are single, but like Mm -hmm. Becca was, or, you know, for any number of people. So I don't want to, I don't want to be too fast to put that label of couple on it, but when it's, you know, trying to connect with friends, Corey and I together, we have found a lot of success with making really last minute invitations like hey tonight do you want to come over tonight for dessert do you want to meet for a drink later tonight after dinner Um, or even just like you know two days from now like do you want to come over for lunch after church on Sunday but keeping that window really short and it Mm -hmm. seems counterintuitive Mm -hmm. and and many times it it doesn't necessarily work but it reduces that risk a little bit. Like it doesn't feel like it's, it's such a big, you know, the rejection feels smaller when it's like, Hey, this is super last minute. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think a lot of us have that fear of being rejected, but when we know it's like, Hey, the chances are, this isn't going to work, but like, maybe it could work. And it also builds a rhythm with the people around us that, that this is something we do. And so within our friend group, I find that happening more and more and more. And it's like every now and then it actually clicks and you know, that, that last minute thing works, but in the meantime, we all just keep asking Mm -hmm. that has introduced a really cool rhythm of everyday friendship 
where we can have the feeling of, you know, so, so on the one hand, I'm saying plan it ahead. And on the other hand, I'm saying, don't really plan it ahead, just kind of roll with life and see where it takes you. And I think both of those together, you know, we, we can try different things mm -hmm. with different people at different times, but it, it really does. For me, it gives me the feeling of kind of like how I saw my parents be when I was a little kid with their friend group. It was just very, it was easy and simple and last minute. And it just felt very ordinary and you know, it just, it simplified things a lot. So it helps me to get out of my head and feeling like I have to just, you know, make it a lot more complicated and it, and it just helps keep it simple. Well, and as I think of that, that idea of energy and how much energy we have at the yeah. end of the day, it's normally pretty low. So we're not wanting to do a big dinner or we're not wanting, right. you know, those are more the few and far between. Whereas you know, just having a glass of wine or having someone yeah. over for a campfire or whatever, right. Yes. Whatever it is, that simple thing. Yeah. And that's totally like energy wise. Oh, okay. I can do yeah. that. And one of my friends in particular will often say we are free tonight. Um, Jason, you know, they're a married couple. So she'll say, Jason is coming. I'm going to wait and see how I feel. Because it's that very thing you're talking about, Krista, at the end of the day, like, I don't know if I feel like going out or not, but to normalize a lot of this, like, just let's make this as easy as possible. And so, you know, we end up with like different combinations of people and, but I, I really, really appreciate that Courtney is comfortable in, in being honest about her own life and her own needs. And that's, that's kind of where we want to get when it comes to friendship, because that teaches me that I have the freedom to, to do the same, that if they all have plans some night and I'm just not feeling up for it, there's no judgment or shame and saying, you guys go have fun. I just am too tired. I, I cannot do it. So whatever we can do to make it easier on ourselves, but also easier on the people around us to fall into a rhythm of friendship, I think we're better for it, but we do have to just put a little bit more intention and work into it on the front end. Yeah. And as I think back to Alex's question, you know, how do we make people feel valued? Well, just from the invite, you make them feel valued. Yeah. So you have that connection there, even if they refuse, if they just that night yeah. don't have the bandwidth to come or they can't come, they feel love that they were invited. Yeah. And that and keeps connection. I always say when people make an invitation, we can't make it work. Please ask again, you know, mm -hmm. or, or to, to remember to be the person on the other side asking again, because, mm -hmm. it, you know, we want it to be kind of something that goes both ways, but I think it, it can be hard enough to put yourself out there. So if I have to be the one to say to somebody like, oh, that doesn't work. You know, I want them to know that I, like you said, I feel valued just by being asked and mm -hmm. I want to make this work. So let's keep trying. Sometimes it takes a while. Sometimes it takes a while of trying before all the stars align. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a mindset shift. I think for those of us that live by the calendar to say, um, okay. And I think to Krista's point, different people have different capacity to be able That's to it. just switch mindsets. I'm much more ready at the end of the day after working by myself all day yeah. to, to take that spontaneous invitation than my husband who's been with people and feels drained. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, so kind of recognizing that too, and how you can make that work for everyone in your family. Cause I've heard people say too, you know, recognizing their older kids, some kids just need that downtime after I've been, been at school yep. all day. Yep. And the last thing they want is another forced social situation, <laughs> right. even though mom is raring to go. Yeah. So kind of balancing everybody's needs and giving permission and yeah. figuring out how can I still invest in the kinds of friendships that will feel great to me. And I don't yeah. mean that friendship always has to feel good. It can feel yeah. hard and uncomfortable too, but yeah. we don't want to put our own needs aside in this area because we are with a bunch of people who are tapped out at the end of right. the day, like yep. figuring out how to still have friends. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we're all just different. And, and I'm, I am a classic introvert. And that's just another, that's another layer too, is, mm -hmm. is recognizing, you know, I have to push myself a little harder sometimes because I generally would like to be at home with a book 
<laughs> you know, in a quiet house, it doesn't happen very often, but that always sounds fun to me. <laughs> and yet I know, you know, I also spend a lot of time working alone and in a quiet house and it, I kind of have to push myself out the door a little bit, but I really don't ever regret it. It's like you get to the other side of that and, and feel like, oh yeah, that's, that's exactly what I needed. Mm -hmm. um, but to, to be able to build friendships with people who, who honor these differences, who honor that, you know, we've got different personalities and, you know, all the things that, that might be different between us, but that's kind of what it's about in finding those real lasting connections is that we can all truly be free to be ourselves. And that just takes maturity on your part and the people around us. Right. So we have to be mature mm -hmm. about how we're approaching friendships, mm -hmm. which let's, let's hope by midlife we were getting there, right? We're getting, <laughs> Maybe we're we haven't there. always been there, but we're getting there. <laughs> And then, you know, for the people around us too, is just having people in our lives who recognize that there's differences and that's okay. Yeah. Well, Shannon, I would love to hear, can you just tell us about a time that someone has really made you feel loved in friendship Oh man. or, yeah. or maybe a couple of practices that you feel like, I mean, you've mentioned some today, but are there any that come to mind? Yeah, I think I think back to times when I have been forced into accepting help and, and coming to understand, I mean, those, those times were honestly, they spring to memory quickly because they, they have shaped me in so many ways. They have taught me how to be a better neighbor because my, my default has been to always be the one kind of um, you know, taking care of my own stuff and, you know, tough and not needing a lot of help. But there was a, there have been more than one time that I've thrown out my back. I don't know what's going on with my back, but I do know that it causes me <laughs> severe issues now and then. And, and it, it forces me into this place of just really confronting my need, confronting, you know, that I do need help, um, that it's, it's humbling to receive I can think of, it was around the time that I was finishing this manuscript for start with hello. I was under an intense deadline. I was in the home stretch and the, the back thing happened. And so I'm trying to, you know, sit in a chair and type. And my friend Jody showed up in my kitchen with a bag of warm apple fritters. And mm -hmm. I just remember like the kitchen is just a disaster. I am a wreck. I probably hadn't showered in two days. I mean, it was, it was the most humbling thing, but in that moment, just recognizing like we have to be willing to ask for what we need and to offer what we can and to, and to just take turns with that. It was a small thing for Jody, Like, you know, it was like a $4 bag of fritters, but she knew that I was struggling. She knew that I probably was not cooking and probably wasn't even eating. And she just showed up in the midst of in the midst of my need. And, and it's been a good lesson. I, I could tell you a hundred stories like that. It's been such a lesson for me and just showing up for people without being even asked. And also with, with being willing, with being, with being willing, that's hard to say, being willing to say, I need help. Like, can you help me with this? Or I am struggling or, you know, being the vulnerable, vulnerable person and going first with that. Yeah. Bless Jody and the apple fritters. That is, they were so that is just the lesson I'll never right there. Them. <laughs> well, Shannon, what can people find in your book? What's that? Sorry. What can people find in your book? If they're, they're wanting just more, more of this kind of conversation, mm -hmm. like kind of what more about what the book is about Yeah, or, and just yeah. your chapters that you've got. Yeah, so I set this book up to be a really simplified and very, very practical guide to how do we actually do this thing? It's like answering the question, how the heck do we do it? Because I think it's, you know, I've, I've written a lot about the ideas of neighboring and I, a lot of my writing, even in Start With Hello, but I tend to write through storytelling and that's just how I operate. Um, but to give some, some more context to the whole idea of, you know, we understand maybe why it matters to, to be, to live as neighbors, but how do we do the thing? And so I set this up in 10 chapters. Each chapter is focusing on a different area of living as neighbors and how do we do it? 
So mm -hmm. it's broken down in the simplest of terms. You know, there's a chapter about listening and a chapter about inviting people into our spaces, into our homes specifically, and then a whole chapter on what do we feed people. And spoiler alert, we don't have to really feed them anything fancy at all. We don't even have to feed them necessarily mm -hmm. because we're not all comfortable with that. And that can feel really overwhelming and can be a barrier that, that kind of stands between us and connection. So yeah, it's, it's chapter after chapter of just a really specific um, part or a, a specific theme on neighboring and how we really put that into practice. So I'm hoping that it invites people to to put themselves out there just a little bit, to take that risk and to believe that when we know the people around us, people in our community, even people right here in our neighborhoods, when we get to know them and form some level of connection, our lives become safer and more secure because a lot of times we think it's the opposite. You know, we think we're safer if we're kind of, you know, in our little cave alone, but our lives do become safer when we're better connected. They also become a lot more fun. Um, they become more complex and messy, maybe in some ways, if we're being honest, but, but I think all those things together, that's, that's what we mean when we talk about the abundant life, you know, it, it means we get it all. So good, Shannon. I feel like there needs to be some kind of joint venture between start with hello and loving your actual neighbor. Like there needs to be something happening <laughs> with Shannon and Alex in the neighboring situation. That's what I'm feeling right now. <laughs> <laughs> we've been on the same, we've been tracking for a while and I love mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. It's always, it's always affirming and comforting to see that you're not the only one stuck in this groove. Mm -hmm. And it gives mm -hmm. me hope, Alex, because it's mm -hmm. like, this is, we know it can mm -hmm. be a difficult thing to articulate. And, and it's, it's not helpful for me to just say, just trust me. But that's mm -hmm. what I honestly want to say sometimes, like, just put yourself out there and be a little more intentional, pay attention to your place a little bit more mm -hmm. and just trust me that mm -hmm. it's going to make life better. And I know mm -hmm. Alex, that you get that if nobody else in the world necessarily <laughs> gets that, I know yes. you do. Right, right. No, I, I think it's uh, a lot of overlap. I mean, yeah. a chapter on listening. We both have it in the book. So um, you but can't, you can't be a neighbor if, right. if we can't be neighbors, if we can't get better at listening to each other, it's just right. the way it goes. Right. Mm. Yeah. We, we need more of it all over the world, but especially yeah. on this little part patch of land that we're on. That's, that's the whole thing. And I think you'll probably agree with this, but I, I really truly believe that as, as we become better connected and our neighbors become, our, our neighborhoods become better connected, that by definition means our world is becoming better connected. Mm -hmm. So there's something really kind of uh, rooted and simple and basic, but it's, it's just a, it's a profound truth that if we would all take up this work in small ways, knowing selfishly that we have a lot to gain from it, it really does just make the world better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So small good. ways. That's the emphasis. Small simple, ways. Yeah. It's simple, small mm -hmm. steps. It does I not. And, and honestly, I don't even feel like, you know, when somebody picks up, start with hello, I don't want anybody to feel like, oh my gosh, 10 chapters. Now I've got to do 10 whole new things. No, the whole book is set up to, to take tiny baby steps, simple steps, pick one, pick mm -hmm. one thing that you're going to kind of focus on and, 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 you know, kind of put into practice and go from there. Yeah. Well, thank you, Shannon. We are so excited thank about your you, message. Friends. And obviously this is, this is a message that, that hits close to home with Alex and her book and just kind of what we talk about here at the sisterhood. Yeah. It really is. It, it resonates deeply with us. So thank you for coming on today and being a part of this series. Thanks for having me. Okay. Bye Shannon. See ya. Bye. Bye-bye.